the League of Women Voters is pleased to bring you a debate among five candidates for school committee. I'm Hannah Kimberly. Uh, I'm a, a Gloucester resident, the president of the League of Women Voters of KBAN, and your moderator. Uh, early voting began today, June 12th, but there's also early voting on Monday, June 14th, and Tuesday, June 15th, and the Rockport town election is Tuesday, June 22nd. Uh, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization for people of all genders, which encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government. Um, one way we do this is by presenting candidates directly to you, the voters, in a fair and equal format. So we hope that over the course of this program, you'll learn more about each candidate and what they hope to do for the town. There will be no formal opening statements from the candidates, but there will be closing statements of two minutes each. Um, I'll be asking questions prepared by the League of Women Voters, which the candidates have not seen. The format to discuss each question is for eight to 12 minutes. So each candidate will have a minute and a half to speak, after which time permitting, candidates can answer each other for 30 seconds. So just um, raise your hand or, si or signal to me if you want to do that. Um, and this does not include uh, closing remarks. So if you speak close to the minute and a half mark, our timekeeper will give you a 10 second warning um, after which you'll be asked to just finish your sentence. And what she'll literally say is 10 seconds. Um, since our goal here is to include as many different issues as possible, I ask that you all keep to the specific subject of each question. Um, and I think we have decided to keep ourselves on mute while other candidates are speaking and then unmute ourselves uh, to speak. Okay, does that make sense to everyone so far? Excellent. All right, so now um, I'm going to uh, read your bios and those are starting off in alphabetical order. So our first candidate is Liz Flanagan. Uh, Liz graduated from Rockport High School in 1999. You would have known her back then as Liz Fiumara. Am I saying that right, Liz? Great. She lives on Granite Street with her husband, Patrick, and their three kids, Olivia, who is Rockport Middle School bound, and Charlie and Lucy, who were both headed to fifth grade at Rockport Elementary School. Liz is running for school committee to ensure that a balanced approach to education is provided to all Rockport children. Meeting the needs of all types of learners is a priority for Liz. Uh, she graduated from Salve Regina University with a Bachelor of Science in Elementary Education with a minor in Special Education. Her first job out of college was working in the Special Education Department as a Special Education aide. After completing a year in Rockport, she went to teach elementary school for the next 10 years. One of her passions is being an assistant coach for her daughter's softball team. When she's not on the field, you can find her hooting and hollering on the sidelines on the basketball, soccer, and baseball fields. All right, our next candidate is Michael Kelly. Michael's support of the Rockport Public Schools began in 2008 with work as a parent on an application that ultimately resulted in the district receiving 400,000 uh, 400, multi-year grant. He served back-to-back -back terms on school committee in 2009 and 2012 and won a 2018 writing campaign to avoid leaving the committee shorthanded. During his three terms on the committee, he has served uh, as chair, leading the group and hiring the current superintendent of schools, several directors of student services and negotiating multiple contracts with all of the Rockport public school bargaining units. He has nearly a decade of experience reviewing school line item budgets. The Rockport public schools are at a major inflection point, says Kelly. I'm running for a final term for two major reasons. The first, to ensure that there's a smooth handoff from the current superintendent to the next, who will be appointed in a little more than a year. I wanna make sure that the transition is supported by someone with a record of supporting education and a strong awareness of the historical town issues that challenge the complex ecosystem that comprise the schools. The second reason is to complete putting in place an ongoing long range plan uh, that will help define what shapes the Rockport schools should, uh, should what shape the Rockport schools should take in the future. 
Michael has worked as um, an executive in K-12 publishing for more than two decades, often synchronizing the efforts of large technical and creative groups. He and his wife, Kathy, have lived in Rockport for the past 25 years and have two sons, one a recent graduate of Rockport High School and one who is currently a sophomore. A lifelong learner, Michael has a BA in English literature and completed work on an MBA during the pandemic, which he will receive in May. Our next candidate is John Kolakowski. He is a proud father of a graduate from the Rockport school system. He believes Rockport schools can get even better, so he decided to run for school committee to, to contribute and be part of the solution. As a member of the Rockport school committee, he will work with parents and teachers to safely keep the schools open as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. He will promote and support the courses that benefit the college bound as well as the trade bound student. But he'll focus on efforts even more in math, science, English, US and world history and the trades. He'll foster a school environment that will encourage individual student participation and development. He'll support a balanced budget that maintains school excellence while not overburdening taxpayers and homeowners and fight to ensure local control of our school system, not special outside interest. Mr. Kolakowski's uh, background and experience that will help him accomplish his goals are moving his son from a large school like Andover to the smaller school environment of Rockport. Uh, he can appreciate the benefits and deficiencies found in both. He's got over 40 years of successfully working in R&D, engineering, management, and business. For the past 10 plus years, he's been running a small industrial coding firm, which he created and built. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in chemical engineering and an MBA. Uh, and for four to five years, he was an active volunteer on the Big Brother, Big Sister Youth Mentoring Program. He has many years of creating budgets, living with them and their consequences, and refining them. Uh, he also taught English to adults through the Gloucester Sawyer uh, library program, uh, as well as coaching soccer in Andover for six years. Our next candidate is Mark Lorenz. Uh, Mark is an experienced educator committed to giving the students, teachers, parents, and caregivers of Rockport the fresh start they all deserve. He has 16 years of classroom experience and currently teaches seventh grade math at the Ipswich Middle School. Mark's passion in education is teaching through project-based learning. Some of his work as an educator has been highlighted in education journals and was one of the reasons why his school won a prestigious national award in 2019. Mark and his wife, Alexandra, have lived in Rockport for 20 years and have two kids in the Rockport school system. Ella is just finishing her sophomore year in high school and Tessa will be moving up to the middle school next year. An invested parent, Mark appreciates the need to have your voice heard. Uh, he has a master's in education from Salem State and a business management degree from Colorado State University. So he understands the need for physical responsibility. And Mark is a trustee of Awesome Rockport, a philanthropy group that supports local initiatives in the schools and community. If you see Mark biking in the woods or walking the beach, feel free to stop and ask him questions, voice your concerns, or share your ideas. Mark promises to bring his passion for education and his fresh energy to the school committee. And then last but not least, we have Katie Mazio. Uh, Katie Mazio lives on South Street with her husband, John, and their three children, uh, Eliza, Rocco, and Leo. Katie grew up in Gloucester and attended Gloucester Public Schools through eighth grade. She graduated from Bishop Fenwick High School in 1996 and went on to study PR and professional writing at Salem State for three years. She spent many years in hospitality, most notably in wedding and event sales, coordinating and management. She then worked as an agent and registered representative for New York Life Insurance Company. In her fourth year, she decided to focus on supporting her stepson through high school and raising her two kids uh, with her youngest child on the way. She returned to New York Life in January of 2020. Katie is relatively new yet proud and enthusiastic Rockport, uh, Rockport Rotary Club member. She served as the advisor to the trustees of the Grover J. Cronin Memorial Fund and scholarship in Waltham for 11 years. Katie was elected and served on the parish council for Holy Family Parish of Cape Ann for six years. 
Uh, she was recently tapped by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to chair a new parent advisory council for the town due to her vast knowledge and experience with student services and special education. Katie also serves on the family readiness group for the Army National Guard 379th Engineers Company out of Buzzards Bay. Katie is a proud military wife and her husband John served in the US Marine Corps for four years and is currently entering his 13th year of service in the National Guard. Katie values service above self and is proud to hold down the fort at home while her husband is away on deployment. She is grateful to be part of the Rockport community and for the opportunity to be a candidate for the school committee. All right, so welcome to all of our, our candidates. Um, and now we're gonna get started with question one. Uh, question one is what new and creative ideas do you have for supporting Rockport education? What new and creative ideas do you have for supporting Rockport education? And we'll start with Ms. Flanagan. Hi, and thank you, Hannah, um, and the League of Women Voters for um, hosting this debate tonight, today. Um, it's wonderful to have everybody here. So the, uh, what I'm going to bring to Rockport Public Schools is that I am a mother of three. We have had quite a year. I have three totally different learners. I have one child who needs enrichment. I have another child who needs support and has been on an IEP and that we have um, gone through the whole IEP pro process. And to be totally honest, I have another child who just kind of goes with the flow of the classroom. What I'm going to bring as a new, and I, I don't even want to say new because our school committee is doing it now, um, but I just want to bring the voice of all of our community together and make sure that I am bringing a voice of solid understanding of our families and our community and what it needs to our school committee. Thank you. Um, what new and creative ideas do you have for supporting Rockport Education Kelly? Sure, well, thank you, um, Hannah. Thank the League of Women Voters, most especially thank the candidates because the last time I ran, no one ran. I had to run a write-in campaign. So it's great to see this much interest. And most of all, to whoever eventually watches this, thank you for doing so because up until COVID, our sort of gross annual total of visitors to school committee meetings hovered in the 10 range per year, been getting 100 people per meeting during COVID. So I really hope that continues. I think it's important to point out when we talk about what sort of ideas you're bringing to the table, that the school committee often, uh, the school committee is often compared to board of directors with the superintendent as the CEO or chief operating officer. So what you're bringing really as a board of directors is oversight, policy creation, and advocacy for the students in the system. The operations are left to the superintendent. And Massachusetts is very specific about making sure that the school committee per se is not meddling in curriculum. They leave that to the teachers. They leave that to the educational professionals. They leave that to the standards that Massachusetts is bringing. So within that context, new and creative ideas, one of the great benefits of COVID, if you can even call it a benefit, but we, we have it now, was our one device per student. Um, 10 seconds. Dream. I'm sorry, what? 10 seconds. Yep. Um, computers for every student, co-teaching model expanded, and science and technology expanded within the curriculum. Thank you. Uh, new and creative ideas uh, for supporting Rockport education, Mr. Kalkowski. Well, I think there's a lot of uh, things to be done. Oops. Am I on? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, I guess the best way to put it is I think we could form partnerships or uh, coalitions with other school systems where we could use their better, their efficiencies that are better than ours or their talent, which is better than ours. And also you, they could use our talent. Uh, I think we could save some money and we could perhaps develop a better school system 
and a better uh, educational program for our students. I would like to also keep politics out of the, the classroom. By that, I mean, I simply don't, I don't wanna see other political issues taken in, up in classrooms. I just wanna see a good solid education for the students of Rockport. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lorenz. Uh, thank you, Hannah, and thanks to the League of Women Voters for having us. It's really nice to be here with all the other candidates. <clears throat> um, my passion in education is uh, motivated by project-based learning, where students are gaining knowledge through working collaboratively towards a goal. They're thinking critically. They're working on their interpersonal skills, communicating with each other. We live in such an amazing place, our physical environment. Uh, with the beaches, the woods, the marsh. It's so set up to, to take advantage of this project-based learning. Um, I am a strong advocate of, of learning through this approach. It's something I would like to see more of in our Rockport schools. I'm also working on an initiative right now with Rockport with the green team called the Farm to Table or Farm to Families Initiative, where we're growing food in the gardens and helping with food insecurity in, with Rockport residents. So this is an uh, innovative approach between um, community members and the school that I'd like to take advantage of um, when working more with those partnerships. Um, let's see, I'd also like to think about what else we can um, advocate in our schools for the curriculum. As, as Michael said, uh, um, the school committee um, can't necessarily design that curriculum itself, but I think um, advocating for more- more race and equity training, both for students and teachers um, would be beneficial. And lastly, I'd like to see uh, more community input um, and, a, and a way that we can have a two-way collaboration between community members and the school community. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mazio, creative ideas, um, new and creative ideas for supporting Rockport education. I thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you to all of the other candidates also for being here. And um, thank you to the KPN League of Women Voters. Um, so as Mr. Kelly was saying, that's a very interesting question um, because a school committee in any district in Massachusetts has four functions and we're not allowed to operate outside of those functions. We can't influence curriculum and we can't administer in the schools. So that being said, there are three ways I could see that fresh and creative ideas could be brought in, uh, whether they're mine, my opinions don't matter as much as the opinions of the other parents and taxpayers in town. So for starters, I would listen to what they bring and maybe bring it to the table, whether or not it's, even if it's something we can't write into the curriculum or administration, but I'm sure this question will be asked um, later, but the most important thing we can do to bring fresh new creative ideas into the district is make sure that when Mr. Lebo retires, um, we hire a, super a superintendent that fosters that um, growth of new and fresh and creative ideas within the curriculum that he supervises with his teachers um, and faculty and staff. So that's the most important thing we can do. Another fresh and creative idea um, and desperately needed is to simply keep enrollment up in our schools to keep our schools sustainable without involving neighboring communities. Um, and that's something hopefully, even if it's not within our a job description, we could work with the Board of Selectmen to come up with some ideas for um, helping families to live here in Rockport. Thank you. Thank you. All right, question two. Would you support efforts to bring more school choice children to Rockport and why or why not? Would you support efforts to bring more school choice children to Rockport? Why or why not? And we'll start with Mr. Lorenz. Um. I do support school choice and I would, um, I, I think it's the best for our students' education. I think it adds value in multiple ways to our school and our community. I know there's been some questions regarding the actual cost of school choice lately. Um, Superintendent Lebo has done a very detailed analysis of, of school choice. And it's, I think, clear in his analysis that there is a net gain to Rockport. I think he has the number of 144,000, which he's mentioned in, in numerous um, environments. Um, there's, I believe, 225 school choice students that bring in about 1.2 million in revenue to the Rockport schools. Um, more important though than that financial gain, the um, education experience of our students is so greatly improved from school choice. We're able to offer more classes, 
more electives, there's more programming, honors, AP courses, um, the arts, the musics. So I definitely support school choice for that reason of as the educational gains. Um, in addition, where school choice brings in students from different communities, which is diversifying our student population, which I think is, is a benefit as well. And lastly, um, because of offering all these extra programs, we're able to hire more qualified teachers. If we didn't have school choice, seconds. we didn't have school choice, programs would be cut and we might have to look for part-time teachers. So being able to offer full-time positions to the teachers, we're able to, to retain and keep qualified teachers. So I definitely support school choice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would you support efforts to bring more school choice children to Rockport? Why or why not? Ms. Flanagan. I absolutely um, support school choice. The Rockport public school system is vibrant. The halls are filled with critical thinkers, athletes, musicians, artists, just to name a few. Each has contributed to our school. All those con uh, contributions are invaluable. School choice students add to the vibrant community that we have created for our students and families. Um, economically, school choice is sound because of the value outweighs the cost, just like, um, Mark just said, I met with Rob also, and I, if anybody need, has any questions about the budget, he is absolutely the guy to go to. Um, I would have hours of learning to become an expert. He has it down. School Choice gives Rockport Public Schools the ability to offer extracurricular activities, AP courses, and just the flexibility of a more uh, vibrant um, schedule. And I absolutely support school choice. Thank you. Ms. Mazio. Um, thank you. I absolutely support school choice. Uh, one of the most important things I can point out, we came to Rockport by way of school choice. Uh, we left the Gloucester school system because uh, of several very disastrous situations and we were greeted warmly and welcomed here in a school choice. Um, it's an absolute fact that the district profits from school choice does not lose money, uh, never mind the enrichment of having kids from everywhere else here. It's very important to continue to attract school choice students um, because our enrollment on its own is low um, and we need it. Uh, the ways to, there are several good ways to do that too. The most important being is avoiding um, unnecessary and lengthy school closures. Um, again, in the future, like the sort of disaster that happened this last um, school year during the pandemic, um, that's an important thing to do. There were many parents saying that they would not return to school choice or they were considering it. And some parents were talking about school choice and their kids out of the district. We want to keep them here. Um, STEM and things like that are impressive, but the main reason parents school choice from communities like Gloucester is because they want their kids in a strong community minded, small knit, like 10 seconds, close knit, um, small town community environment with just generally competitive academics. Um, so it's important that we focus on that and we do what we can to attract more school choice students instead of less. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kolakowski. I am for school choice, but I am for school choice um, with a caveat. I do think that we have to look at the financial issues uh, surrounding bringing more students into the school system. We have to see where we could budget uh, better, where we could use our money more effectively so that we minimize any additional costs we may encounter, but yet get the benefits from having more students in our class. So I think it's very important to give students and parents the opportunity to move their children to a school system they think would suit their children better. So I think that's a very, very good option for that we are providing. So I'm for that. But I do think we have to look at it economically to see where we could do better. I think we could do a lot better in the school system with our budgets and looking at the most efficient way to spend our money. That's what I have to say. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Kelly. 
So as many of the candidates mentioned, school choice is both a benefit, it's a net plus economically, it's also a two-way street. 10 years ago in Rockport, we had a large net outflow of kids from choice. Now we have about 28% of our students coming in and last year, as Mark mentioned, about 144,000 after all is said and done and benefit. But of course, this isn't about money. This is about the quality of the classroom, the fact that teachers are more effective when they have a wider range of students that they can teach to engage and get cross-pollination going. And I think, um, I wanna parse your question a little bit because we're all for school choice, but your question was more school choice. And I think I would point out that we're probably at the maximum we can hold with school choice because the point was to fill out classrooms that maybe had a little extra capacity. Once kids come in via school choice, they're allowed to stay for the entire term. And at a certain point, our goal has always been to not add additional teachers as a result of school choice. We've been phenomenally accessible with that, but I think we're kind of at the point where to go beyond that 28% mark actually is the tripwire to start adding staff in, which is not the, the premise that we've been working under. I'd also like to point out that in terms of more efficiently using the budget, Ten seconds. I would like John to actually come to a budget meeting and see the line by line item detail that Mr. LeBeau goes through both on a monthly and an annual basis. I don't know where he thinks the money could be moved more efficiently. Usually that's kind of a code word for um, not being happy with parts of the school, but he has squeezed Time's up. every dime. <laughs> okay. And did anyone want to respond to that or no? Okay, all right. Uh, let's go on to question three. Question three is what other steps would you take during your three year term to deal with the problem of declining enrollment in Rockport? What steps would you take during your three-year term to deal with the problem of declining enrollment in Rockport? And we'll start with Mr. Kolakowski. Uh, that's a very difficult question. And it's a very, how should I put it? I don't know if it's even in the realm of a uh, school committee. You could in, you know, encourage people, I guess, more students, more transfer students by doing better in our school system and getting more recognition. So that would encourage more students and more people. Uh, it is what it is. You're not, you're not gonna dramatically change uh, the population of our town by some school committee action, unless we maybe get transfer, like I said, transfer students, additional transfer students. So I, I don't think there's a great answer that we can effectively change that, so. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. What other steps would you take during your three-year term to deal with the problem of declining enrollment? Ms. Mazio. Hi, uh, thank you, great question. Um, I sort of touched on this before. Um, I feel like there's really only three ways you can address that. Um, one is by, uh, continuing to encourage school choice and hopefully attracting um, more students to that 28%, the maximum we can hold without increasing costs. Um, so there's that. Second thing is to prevent kids from leaving the district. Um, so make our schools more attractive uh, for families considering private school options um, or other school choice districts. And the most important thing is to somehow figure out how to make it so that more families can move here. Now, there's only so much you can do about that as a school committee, but I would love to think that there would be some opportunity to work in partnership with the Board of Selectmen to get creative with that. I watched the Board of Selectmen debate, which was great, but a couple of the ideas that um, people mentioned to have families move here actually would backfire and already have and are one of the reasons we're in this mess. Uh, so getting in-law apartments zoned for renting is part of the problem in Rockport. So many people rent out seasonally weekly that there aren't apartments and homes available to rent for families year round. So it would be interesting to see if the Board of Selectmen would consider either a penalty tax on seasonal weekly renters or a tax credit for people willing a significant credit to keep their homes as year round rentals or apartments. Um, any other thing that can be come up with to make the town affordable for middle-class families to come here and bring their kids here would be excellent. And I'd love to help in some way possible within the scope of the job. Thank you. Thank you. 
Mr. Lorenz, what steps would you take during your three-year term to deal with the problem of declining enrollment in Rockport? Um, thank you. I think that's a very good question. Um, I think we need a long-term sustainability plan, and that's not just with the school, but with um, the town needs to be an integral part of that process um, with the selectmen, the planning board, really all community members. Um, this is the enrollments are not just declining in Rockport, but this is um, there are a lot of schools in the area are experiencing the same types of problems with with smaller numbers. The case report that was just um, come out recently is a good start. I think we need to continue with that effort with renewed interest and even a higher priority. Uh, we need all inputs from all community members, all stakeholders, um, different um, from families with school children to parents um, with people without school age kids, uh, businesses in town, really everybody who's a stakeholder in our community. I think there's a lot of different approaches we can look at. I think we need to be really creative with those approaches. Is it just sharing services maybe with the neighboring district to save some cost? Is it full regionalization? Um, somebody mentioned earlier some vocational programs. That's um, in such need right now and it's so competitive to get into vocational schools. So maybe we could add some vocational programs to our schools in Rockport. And I wonder if in this creative approach, we can come up and make Rockport a true destination for education. Can Rockport become a STEAM innovation school? Can we make it an arts magnet school? Can we make it a co-op where students are learning through doing with community partners? I think just that creative environment where students can thrive as learners is something we really need to, to um, take on. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kelly. Um, so it is, there's no question that across the industrial Northeast, across Cape Ann and in Rockport, our demographics are sliding in terms of school age kids. That doesn't mean we're condemned to a terrible fate. It means we have to act. And as Mark mentioned, a group effort by both the school committee, whose swim lane really has to do solely with the school and with the town planning board, which really hasn't done anything for a number of years to actually connect and come up with a comprehensive plan has to be a priority in the coming years. For those people who are for the override and those who are against, this is the only way out of that mixture. Um, the case report, as mentioned, it hasn't technically released. Someone tried to initiate a Freedom of Information Act request to get it. So we released a draft copy, which they then altered and distributed. But that was the first step in our 10-year plan to decide what the schools would look like. And as a part of that, we started taking a look at the demographics of the community and what we do. A more immediate effort beyond those two committees meeting, and it's great to see that the selectmen are actually talking about this issue in their debate, is to take a look at Essex Tech. Traditionally, Votech schools were for kids who were not academically inclined. Essex Tech rolls into all the Cape Ann schools with a beautiful presentation, a brand new building, and many schools feel they're cherry picking some of the best students who are not actually headed towards a second career. And in fact, they broadcast themselves as a college prep school. Uh, and I think we need to take a look at that because they're siphoning kids off from both Rockport and Gloucester and many other communities. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, Ms. Mazio, did you want a 30 second rebuttal? I would love that. Um, I like what everyone's saying. Um, I'm also one of the people that mentioned working in collaboration if possible with the Board of Selectmen. I like the ideas about the vocational um, programs, but the thing that has to be considered is that's not just the North Shore, uh, the Essex Tech, that's drawing a lot of students. There's a huge pull to that now. And if you look at the statistics of the vocational technical schools throughout Massachusetts, they're accepting one out of every four to six applicants. There's a huge push for that. The cost of running those programs in our own community would be exorbitant, which is why they've reduced them in Gloucester. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Flanagan, what steps would you take during your three-year term to deal with the problems of declining enrollment in Rockport? So the demographics in Rockport are ever-changing. Um, the <laughs> The demographics of Rockport is something, unfortunately, I cannot control by being on the, on the school committee. What I can control is being sure our town has a strong and rigorous school system that will meet the needs of current and potential families living in Rockport. Offering competitive sports programs, visual arts, music programs, foreign languages, um, AP courses, and all other course, course offerings that will keep our schools the rigorous learning environment that attract families. Thank you. 
All right, we're at question four. Um, question four is, do you support the $777,000 Rockport School override on the ballot? This is an override that will occur every year on a permanent basis, increasing 2.5% every year. Do you support it and why or why not? And we'll start off with Ms. Mazio. Thank you. Uh, there we go. Uh, yes, thank you. This is an excellent question. One that I'm sure we all knew was coming. Um, I actually am strongly in favor of the override, but the reason being, um, my dad studied economics, right? And I was raised by someone who was an economist essentially. And that makes me very fiscally conservative. This is actually the most fiscally conservative route to go is to approve this override. Um, I think of a simple analogy, right? If I hired a contractor to build a house um, and they were to go pour the foundation and say they quoted the whole project to be $500,000 for the house. And then they came back to me and they said, we've trimmed every cost we can, um, but I can't help this. The cost of pouring the concrete went up and the regulations now require we have three people standing there instead of two. So unfortunately I have to increase the cost of the whole project by barely 5%. Do you still wanna do it? Well, obviously I wouldn't say, well, let's just use less concrete and make a shakier foundation or let's just cancel the whole project. Obviously you have no choice. You have to put the money into it uh, to make a strong foundation. And I use that as an analogy for why we need the override for our schools. It's actually not a lot of money that they're asking for. Uh, naysayers keep saying, trim the cost, trim the cost. Well, they're already trimmed as much as they can. And, and like it or not, thank you. Like it or not, this is what things cost for the basics. And we can't attract people to come here tying back to that. And we can't have a strong school system without a little more money. Unfortunately, it is what it is. And I strongly support the override. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lorenz. Um, just like Katie, I also support the override. Um, I believe we have a responsibility to educate our students to the best of our abilities. Uh, the override will allow us to replenish the depleted reserves and build for a more rigorous education experience. Uh, Superintendent Lebo has talked about adding STEM classes, electives, and a foreign language program to the elementary school. I support both of those ideas. Um, any, any programming we can add to make for a more robust experience for our students, I support. The, without the override, there are definitely going to be cuts to teachers and services. Um, this is going to um, worsen our experience for our students at school. Um, there are some COVID relief funds coming that um, I know there's been some talk about using those to help mitigate any cuts, but it's really important to note that those, those funds cannot be used to help to supplement our normal operating budget. And they can't be used for the reserves either. And those funds can help mitigate for the first year or maybe the second a little bit with some intervention programs. But after that, the cuts are just gonna keep coming on and keep coming on. So I support the override. Um, a strong school system is reflective of a strong community. It makes Rockport just a much better place to live, a more desirable place to live. I, I do think it's important to note that um, Ten seconds. the override does not give us a free pass to spend uncontrollably, sort of what um, Ms. Mazio was, was speaking about. And I have a business management degree, so I can help with that fiscal responsibility. And um, yes, I also support the override. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kelly. <clears throat> Strong supporter of the override. Um, it's probably worth noting, um, Hannah, that in your description, it actually isn't that the override appears year after year, it's that the override gets added to the base of the town's taxes and then it proceeds. So it is there permanently. But I'd like to point out that Rockport has the lowest tax rate in all of Essex County. It's at, and it's of the 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, it's at like 37 or 38, even with the override, it'll have the 40th lowest tax base. Now nobody wants to be number one, but the reality is the override exists because the town only funds about 75% of the cost of the school, requiring us to dig into our reserve funds for the other 25%. We've been taking an override that was supposed to last five years and we've stretched it out to eventually it'll be 12 years if the override passes and it actually arrives. So again, we've been squeezing every nickel through that period, even though the amount of requests made by the state in terms of funding specialized teaching resources has continued unabated. So the, the basic, although nobody wants their taxes to rise, 
We have an artificially low tax base in Rockport and we need to support our schools because that's really a vote on the philosophy of the town. Whether you wanna have a multi-generational community, and whether you wanna have a vacation and retirement community with a suppressed tax rate, I vote for my multi-generational. Thank you. Uh, next, Ms. Flanagan. Thank you. I fully support the override. I see no, I see no reason to not support the school moving forward. Our schools are the heart of our community. We need to support them. Thank you. Mr. Kolakowski. Thank you for this opportunity to respond to this. Uh, I think we have to not just accept the fact that I'm sure there's been a lot of processing of reviewing of the budget and where the monies are spent. And we think we have a handle on that. I'm not convinced of that fact. I'm not convinced it's a fact. I think we have to look very carefully before we start asking for overrides. I'm, I'm not in agreement with the, I guess the majority of people here that want the override. I'm actually against the override, not because of the money. It's more because I don't think we've done uh, due diligence in reviewing the budget in an adequate way. Uh, after all, we have, I, what is it? I think it's like 140 full-time people in the school system, and then with assistant with the support, it's like 170 people supporting the school system or working for the school system full time. And then I think some like 210 people uh, working for the school system, counting part timers and so forth. Uh, that's a lot of people working in the school system. 10 now, seconds. If they're all doing a very good job, I'm all for an override. But I'm not convinced that's the case. I think we have to look at the funds and how we're spending it more carefully. And Thank rebut what you want, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Kelly. I just want to point out that the override was approved unanimously by the Board of Selectmen, by the school committee, and overwhelmingly by the finance committee. So every group charged with oversight, either formally or informally, adjacent or directly, has validated those numbers, which we go over every year in multiple public sessions. And you know, I'd offer to John, I'm, I'm happy to, or I'm happy to have the superintendent take him through it because he really lives in those spreadsheets. I don't see where there's much fat. And I think if you ask the average parent who has a kid in the system, they don't see much either. Okay. Well, since you're bringing it up, uh, I'm sure everyone who ever had a budget would say that. Uh, I've worked with people with budgets, I've developed budgets, and you, there's always places where you could do better and optimize your money. And uh, I totally disagree with that. Uh, and again, it's the school committee, the selectmen uh, are not paying for the increase. It's the citizens and the landowners of Rockport. And I think we owe it to them. Ten seconds. Carefully. Great. Thank you both. And just as a side note, uh, the finance committee uh, vote was four to three. Uh, don't ask me who voted for what, but there was a four to three vote on that. Uh, Ms. Mazio. Thank you. I, you know, very respectfully, I'm just confused as to like what anybody would want to cut from our our budget and how. You know, again, respectfully, how anyone could doubt that this has been gone over with a fine tooth comb. Nobody is going to come to the townspeople of Rockport and ask them to approve an override without doing their homework first. That wouldn't make any sense. Yes, so exactly. obviously everything has been trimmed where it possibly could be. And the fact of the matter is, like I mentioned in my analogy earlier, things cost more. That's beyond our control. We have to do what we have to do to make up for it or we're failing our children and our whole community. Thank you, Ms. Mazio. Thank All right, you. we're going to continue on to what is going to end up. We're going to continue on to what okay. we, we have six, six minutes to get through another question for all of you to answer, uh, as well as your uh, final two minute comments. So uh, question five is, 
Have you read the Cape Ann study for education, which is the case report that some of you have already brought up? And if so, what major takeaways did you glean from the report? Have you read the case report? And if so, what major takeaways did you glean from the report? And we'll start off with Mr. Kelly. So um, Hannah, quick update. Although the formal vote of the FinCom was four to three, the FinCom chairman at town meeting reported that because three members are absent and he had polled him, the actual margin of approval by the FinCom was more than two to one. Uh, in terms of the Cape Ann study for education, yes, I did read it. I actually commissioned it. I signed the contract and I served as the point person by their request by both the Gloucester and Rockport School Committee. It has not formally released. There is again a request by an individual who was ghosting our meetings um, for school committee who wanted to try and use the demographics that would likely be in that against us. And so we released it rather than let people speculate. It has not been formally approved by its steering committee, by Rockport or by Gloucester. And what you'll find in there is a baseline discussion um, point. It does not have recommendations that would obviate the need for an override. It was intended fully to start a discussion about what were our opportunities fully envisioned to have multiple studies come out of it for implementation. And we've even approached our state reps, Anne Margaret Ferranti and Bruce Tarr, who have been very positive about funding those implementation steps. So I know I'm very animated about this, but it's because the people who are trying to use this document against us- 10 seconds. That this was the start of a conversation designed to actually save the taxpayers money. Thank you. Okay, so Mr. Kelly, does that mean that most of you have not read it? Is that, can we have a show of hands who has so, read it? So no one can have read the official report because it has not been released yet. It was put on hold because COVID intervened and we kind of had our hands full. There was a copy distributed that was altered by one of the opponents of the case study to take off all of the descriptive information saying this has not been approved by anybody and that was distributed to a smaller group of people who were really animated to prevent the override. Okay, I see what you're saying. Mr. Lorenz, did you wanna add in something? Oh, I, I was just adding that um, I have read the case report and I was just gonna add the, um, as, as Michael said, it's, it's um, very clearly more of a um, baseline data and it's not offering lots of recommendations. Okay, so it's not the whole report, Mr. Kelly and Mr. Lorenz, that's out in the public? A, it was a working draft that was pending final approval. So there were three stage gates for the steering committee before this went to the various Rockport and Gloucester mm -hmm. school committees. And those stage dates consisted of first give feedback on the general government data that they had pulled from to make sure that if there are mistakes between, say, city and town descriptions, that that was understood by the report's creators. This, and that happened. The second stage gate was to make sure that in interviews with subject matter experts about what could we do differently in both Rockport and Gloucester, the co-sponsor of the study, um, that we clarified that. And so, for example, we had an issue where one of the teachers trying to be very supportive in Gloucester identified a position that actually hadn't been in place for 10 years because it was at the school level. The third stage gate did not conclude, which was a general overview of the finished document because of COVID. Okay, so I just, I mean, I'd seen that the title page says final, but you're saying that it's not, so. No, no, we, this was stamped repeatedly and with a watermark that said not approved by the Rockport Steering Committee, I'm sorry, the, the um, Case Steering Committee, the Rockport School Committee or the Gloucester School Committee. And that's what was submitted to our um, town clerk, that was removed by people who wanted to use that information against us. And that very fact was called up in a FinCom meeting by someone trying to quote from the report and the chair of the FinCom chastised them for altering the document. And so what you're describing, the final on it, is exactly why we put the stamp on there so that the public would not be misled. But beyond all of that, it does not have recommendations that are executable. It was a first stage to allow each Ten school seconds. in their community to talk with their um, public, come up with solutions, and then potentially present them. Okay. Uh, implement them, sorry. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. I have a question. 
concerning the case, when was this issued? When did, was this uh, report done? This, this report, the working copy of the final draft delivered just as the schools were closing down for COVID. So by mutual agreement between Rockport and Gloucester, because we were focusing on how do we support kids in the middle of a pandemic, that wasn't necessarily the time to talk about, do we think we could share SPED services? Do we think we could pay, fair, spare, um, share busing issues? That sort of thing. Okay. And yeah, I, when, when exactly was it done? So in April, we had a request and we decided to honor the working copy being released to prevent this sort of nonsense from interrupting the override. I understand that, but you didn't answer my question. When was the report done? Mr. Kolakowski, I think he, oh, when was it done? It yes, when was it completed? I, I'm just curious. Uh, it was not completed. The working draft was submitted before the school shut down for COVID. So it's he's so, so now that is probably so this is just ago, a draft right? form you have. Is that so, all you're saying? Is what yeah, he's saying it's not complete. Okay. Correct, Mr. Kelly. Correct. Okay. Correct. Right. Um, based on that, if you all will indulge me for, do you want to go an extra question? Are you comfortable with that? Okay, great. So, <clears throat> pardon me. The next question and final question is is what do you see is the most serious problem facing each of the Rockport schools, elementary, middle, and high, and, and high school? Um, and we're gonna actually go with the order that um, I had for the last question since we didn't get through everyone. So we'll start with Mr. Kelly. Sure, sure. So I think a common problem as evinced by social media is that many of our teachers and many of our great teachers have been exposed, particularly in COVID, to a tidal wave of commentators safe in their home in their comfy chairs, criticizing how they're teaching, how they're performing, how they're executing. I can tell you the summer before we opened up for COVID, endless amounts of time were spent by these people trying to respond to the state to come up with plans for a fully remote, a fully in-person, and then a hybrid plan They've been trying to wrestle with their own individual issues in terms of supporting elderly parents in their homes, supporting their own children, and also trying to master how you deliver instruction to children who are in front of you in the classroom and also streaming live because their parents don't want them to come in for a variety of health reasons. So if I could wave a magic wand, one of the things I'd love to do is get support from the public in acknowledging the effort these teachers have put in. There's an assumption um, and particularly during COVID, that somehow the teachers don't have their own lives that they have to manage in the pandemic as well. And they have to take risks that many of us did not have to take by going to an actual job. So for me, that's a great challenge. Ten I think seconds. the other challenge is hyper-focus on test results. We try and create critical thinkers by the time a child leaves the school. Hyper-focusing on a single test result or on a range of test results makes it very difficult for our teachers to do their job. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kolakowski, what do you see as the most serious problem facing the Rockport schools? It's a very tough question. Uh, I right? think the big problem for the Rockport schools are uh, what's going to happen to them down the road. Uh, I'm very concerned with the decreasing numbers and the cost escalations that ultimately it may end up being regional, which may or may not be a bad uh, situation for some students. But I find that the Rockport school system is a small school system, which I think is a, uh, caters to individuals very well. And I'd like to see that continue. The Rockport school system had uh, was regarded very highly, I guess, it might have been like 10 years ago, uh, they even had some uh, articles about it, how well they do. And I'd like to see that continue, but I'm very concerned that the economics and the population changes are going to affect that in an adverse way. I do, I am a supporter of small schools. Uh, by small schools, I'm talking, you know, maybe a thousand or, or less. Uh, I think children have a chance to blossom in a smaller environment. 
and I would like to see that continue. And it's going to be a difficult road Ten seconds. to follow uh, with the economics the way it is. And I, that's why I'm so very concerned that we have to address any economical issues to, and try to minimize our costs and also try to benefit the education as well as possible by reaching out to other schools and working with them and perhaps joining forces in certain key areas. Thank you. Ms. Flanagan. Thanks. So kind of to piggyback on Mr. Kelly's um, idea of social media and parents. Um, so during COVID, I watched my own children struggle and thrive in their learning environments. Um, being an educator combined with being able to stay home during the school day allowed me to help supplement my kids' curriculum and classroom activities with some of my own help and support. Some needs were met and some were not. Being able to recover any lost academic needs is a top priority for me and all the families that were put in the same position. The federally funded ESSER grant, which is the Elementary and Se Secondary School Emergency Relief Grant, will help supplement this learning loss over the last year and accelerate us going forward. During COVID, there were times we felt let down as parents, we felt unheard, and looking back at the school committee, they did their best they could, giving the facts that they had. They sent us back to school when they were confident with their decisions, and they felt it safe to send our students back. I would like to move forward instead of looking back. At this time, I would like to thank the school committee for all their tireless efforts, keeping our kids safe. Our kids are safe because of your hard work, so thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mazio, what are the most serious problems facing each of the Rockport Um, So for starters, uh, we do have an issue with our curriculum not being as competitive as it is with some neighboring districts. Um, I can speak to that because one of my three children actually attends um, school in Manchester uh, due to a IEP need that he has. He's school choice in there out of Rockport uh, because that program is not available in Rockport. But and it won't be, and it wouldn't be cost effective to have that here. That's not what I'm suggesting. However, um, because of that, and he's been in the Manchester Essex district since kindergarten, and my daughter's been in Rockport. Rockport has been an absolute godsend for my daughter. Um, it's because of the teachers in Rockport that my daughter has been able to learn and be as successful as she has been. That being said, my son, who's two grades below my daughter, uh, has consistently since kindergarten been working on the same material she is two years ahead of him, always. Uh, I asked about this in Manchester and they use a concept called spiraling curriculum and the teacher in a group team meeting with both districts, they said, we do that here in Rockport, but we don't. Um, that's something we need to work on is more competitive um, academic curriculum. I'd like to address, if I may, what Mr. Kelly said and even Ms. Flanagan, respectfully, you're both wrong. Um, parents did not insult teachers on social media during the pandemic. If they did, I never saw it. And I was very involved with social media and I've been at every single school committee meeting since the schools were shut down without fail. Uh, parents insulted, some parents were upset with and Ten maybe seconds. insulted. Thank you, the job that the school committee did. But the reason is if you look back on record, if you read minutes and statements and actually watch the videos, you'll see that when we simply asked questions, we were rudely insulted and called bullies and all sorts of things that didn't even make sense. Um, and it's on record, so you can rebut all you want, but I advise anyone watching to go back and watch the videos from the school committee meetings and you'll see what I'm talking about. So people were mad and they had a right to be, and they were not mad at teachers. Thank, thank you, Matthew. Um, Mr. Kelly, 30 seconds. Righteous indignation is a powerful emotion because it allows you to take a complex problem and turn it into a black or white issue. In the pandemic with mama and papa bears trying to protect their kids, we saw a lot of that. We did not, we were not rude to anyone in any of those meetings. However, the role of the chair is to make sure the committee has enough information to make a decision on. And when that information starts to become prevarication from the public, it's time to stop the debate and allow them to vote. I stand behind my comments for the teachers. I think they did an awesome job and they were beaten up. Thank you, Ms. If I may respond. You may, 30 seconds. I Again, there's not much I have to say. The proof is in the videos and in the minutes. We asked questions and we were insulted. I brought up the fact that two middle schoolers in our community uh, attempted suicide during school closures. And I was told that that wasn't true. It is. Uh, one of them was hospitalized for it. Um, and also, 
it's just in and, and he Mr. Kelly just did it again. He said and righteous and, righteous indignation instead of just saying they were frustrated and they had a right to be because we weren't communicating or being transparent and we weren't respecting their questions. If we they had just said, sure, let's look into that, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. You should watch the videos, everyone. You won't find they should. Problem. You okay. should. It was great. I, I'm going to cut you both off now um, and give Mr. Lorenz a chance to answer. Uh, what do you see, Mr. Lorenz, as the most serious problems facing each of the Rockport schools? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so I'd first like to uh, thank Michael and the rest of the school committee and everyone in the Rockport schools for the last year of their work. I didn't always agree with all the decisions myself, but I do think that the school committee and superintendent, I do believe they were making the best decisions they could at the time with the information that they had. And in hindsight, it's easy sometimes to look back and question what people did. Um, so like I said, even though I didn't always agree with it, I do appreciate all the work they put into it. So thank you very much for that work, Michael. Um, in terms of your question, Hannah, in terms of areas of improvement in the schools, um, I've mentioned one already. I would like to uh, see more project-based hands-on learning taking place in the Rockport schools. Um, I think it's so critical that our students um, engage in that type of learning. I also think that the emotional and the social emotional support of our students right now is at such a heightened state. Um, a lot of that is from the last year of what's taken place, but it's, it's also just the times we're living in. Um, as a classroom teacher, I see this every year in, with my students. Anxiety levels in students just keep increasing more and more every single year. So the social emotional health and the, the well-being of our students has to take a priority. Um, and the third thing Ten I'd seconds. Like, uh, more of is more collaboration between our community members um, and our stakeholders. Um, the Ed Foundation, the PTO uh, is, is doing some of that. And I think we need to take advantage of those partnerships and, and advance that even further. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lorenz. Okay, these are final statements um, from the candidates. You'll have two minutes each and there will not be any uh, rebuttals to these. And we'll start off with Mr. Kolakowski. I think the most important thing that a, a school committee member can do is listen to the parents and listen to the students and teachers, but they should keep an open mind. I have a feeling that it's not always the case. And I think uh, part of the problem is just simply talking about budgets. Budgets are important issues in the school system to optimize the uh, money spent on schools and to get the best out of the money spent on schools. Uh, when I bring this up, it seemed to have been a, uh, a, a touchy situation for most people. But there should not be a touchy situation. People should be able to talk about issues in the school system where we can improve it. And whether it's financially, whether it's uh, certain technologies, uh, whether we should put the emphasis back on education and the students, and not just on college, but also trade schools and uh, thinking, allowing students to think for themselves as long as we provide the proper tools which is the basic education, we should try to encourage individual thinking in our school systems. This not only applies to the kids, it applies to the students, uh, rather the teachers and uh, the committee is that for that matter as well. I think we should be open, looking at the issue, being flexible and trying to do the best we can to provide the best education for our students. And also, uh, by doing that, and by doing it as economically as possible, we are going to bring in more people interested in the school system. Ten seconds. And um, that will help bring the enrollment up higher and make our school system even better. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kelly. On June 23rd, the candidates you elect will face the usual challenges of strategy, budgeting, oversight, and encouragement, sitting through countless presentations around policy, process, and content. They'll also face two of the largest and most complex issues a school system faces, 
First, we'll be funding a new superintendent for this, finding a new superintendent for the school. The second will be the future of the school itself. If the only candidate or school board member has had actual experience selecting a superintendent, that puts me in a unique position to support that transition. I also believe I have the temperament and skill set to support the defining of the new shape of the school. I strongly believe in a multi generational future for Rockport that supports both young and old. There are other groups that do not. I have fought loud, hard, and publicly to support this view. And as you can tell, I'm pretty passionate about the school. This is my last run for school committee. I strongly believe committee members need to have skin in the game. Having a child in the system allows you another important data point to help judge how the district is doing. And by the end of this term, I will not meet that criteria and thus will be supporting the schools from the outside looking in. I made my decision to run because I believe meeting these two challenges absolutely required some institutional knowledge and depth of experience. And in the event of the, in the, event of the unthinkable, if the override fails to pass, I do not want to leave the school in the position of looking for a new leader under financially catastrophic conditions with 40% of the committee being completely inexperienced in the role. I thank you sincerely for the trust you put in me in the past and I ask you humbly for your vote. But regardless of who you vote for, please vote for the override. You have a school system you can be proud of and it needs and deserves Ten seconds. Your thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Ms. Flanagan. Thank you, Hannah, again, and the League of Women Voters for putting on to today's debate. As I've said before, and I will say it again, I am so fortunate to be surrounded by four other individuals who all want to work together to make our schools the best they can for the students and their families. If elected to the school committee, I promise you, I will give it my all. And as many of the Rockport residents already know, that's the kind of person I am. I will not go into something this important unless I give it my full attention at all times. This is a job I will dedicate my time to. I will make sacrifices for my family so I can work to make a difference for all the families in our community. My approach to a balanced learning is one that will affect each and every family, whether they are from Rockport or Choice Inn. I will work hard for everyone. Rockport deserves a vibrant, academically rigorous, and competitive school we all want for our children. Please vote for me on June 22nd, a lifelong resident, a Rockport graduate, and a Rockport mom. Go Vikings. Thank you, Ms. Flanagan. Ms. Mazio. Thank you. You can see I'm not running as technology as my platform. Thank you for giving me the chance and all of us a chance to give a closing statement. Um, I'm asking for your vote on June 22nd. I genuinely believe that I'm uh, the best person at this particular time for this job. We will be selecting a new superintendent, and I think it's actually more important that someone that has a fresh perspective and different ideas does that. I think you should vote for me because I'm not an educator. Um, I think you should vote for me because although my degree is not, or I don't have a business degree, I actually have years of experience running businesses successfully. Um, you should vote for me because I actually am not trying to push my opinions and ideas on the townspeople of Rockport because those don't matter. If I am elected by people in Rockport, my job is to represent their ideas and work those ideas into the four parameters of what our job actually is. And I have a very firm grasp on what the job is. Um, I have completely different ideas, different life experiences, and a school committee really needs diversity of thought in diversity of life experience. You need somebody with a backbone. I believe that I have the right temperament. I do have a backbone and I'm afraid to speak up if I'm uncomfortable and I need to know more about what's going into a decision and why. Um, I always use a Socratic method when making decisions and I consider the opinions of people that other people have shown um, in the past that they wouldn't deem significant or important enough. Well, everyone's ideas are important. It doesn't matter if you're a gardener, a hairstylist, an educator, um, a lawyer, a doctor, every person that lives in Rockport, their opinion matters and I will represent them all. I will bring all ideas to the table for the school committee. And lastly, as you've seen, yes, people have asked me why would you run for a school committee while your husband's deployed? Well, for starters, he comes home hopefully in October, probably November or December. Ten seconds. Thank you. Secondly, 
I have my hands at a lot of different things and I'm a very busy person, but there's an old expression. If you want to get something done and get it done well and right, you give it to the busiest person in the room. And respectfully, that's me. So please vote for Katie Mazio on June 22nd. I will not let you down. Thank you, Ms. Mazio. Mr. Lorenz, last but not least. Thank you. Um, I have 16 years of education experience and I have the knowledge to help guide our school committee. I have two kids in the school system, so I understand the needs of parents and I'm invested in it. I have a business management degree, so I um, know the need to be fiscally responsible. And I have a proven track record of working together for the common good as a trustee of Awesome Rockport. Uh, in my school, I'm a team leader, which acts as a liaison between the teachers and administrators. I've also been on hiring committees and I agree with Michael that right now, um, the Rockport schools are somewhat at a tipping point and finding the replacement for this superintendent is so vitally important. Uh, we need to, to make sure that we find somebody who can lead us through the next few years, but also bring these community stakeholders together. Uh, I'm very excited to be a part of that process. Uh, working together, the town of Rockport can support the override um, school choice and we can make long-term plans for the future of our schools. These issues can and they must work in tandem with each other. The current and future needs of our schools, they're not in opposition to one another. And we need meaningful collaboration between the different stakeholders and to provide our current students and the future generations of students with every opportunity to make educational gains and thrive. So a vote for me will bring that essential experience to the committee to help us move forward. And thank you very much, Hannah, for having us. Really appreciate you doing this. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Lorenz. All right, that concludes our debate. Um, I thank you all so much for participating um, in this debate. And also, uh, I'd like to thank 1623 Studios for airing it. Um, they will uh, edit out all of our, um, please uh, mute yourselves and please unmute yourselves and get that online um, in the next uh, couple of days, uh, early next week. Uh, so it'll be posted on the KBAN, League of Women Voters KBAN website, which is lwvkban.org. Um, and uh, we will share it on social media. I ask if you can to share it as well on social media. Uh, the 2020 Selectman debate last year, um, went out on social media, sort of like just spread like wildfire, which was great. So um, if you could do that, that would be lovely. Um, and uh, Rockporters out there, please don't forget to vote. There's early voting on Monday, June 14th. There's early voting on Tuesday, June 15th. And the town election is Tuesday, June 22nd. Wouldn't it be a miracle if everyone in Rockport went out and voted? It would be a, a dream come true for the League of Women Voters. All right, everyone. Thank you so very much.